Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll start, as always, with an update on the current position in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,471 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 53 from the figures I gave you yesterday. However, I need you to note today that this figure of 53 includes 40 older positive test results, uh, which have only been received today uh, and are being added to the overall total now. A total of 1,168 patients are currently in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of 122 from yesterday. However, please note that the number of confirmed cases in hospital actually decreased by 23 compared to the figures yesterday. A total of 34 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is an increase of seven since yesterday. Uh, all seven of those are suspected cases at this stage, not confirmed cases. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,721 patients who had tested positive and required admission to hospital uh, for the virus have now been able to leave hospital. And unfortunately, in the last 24 hours, 12 deaths have been registered of patients confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. And that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,375. Of course, tomorrow uh, we will have the weekly report from National Records of Scotland, uh, which includes confirmed and suspected uh, deaths from the virus. Uh, each one of these, of course, is an individual whose loss is being grieved and mourned uh, by many. And I want again today to send my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this illness. Uh, lastly, on statistics, I can confirm that the latest report on delayed discharges has been published today. That includes details on the number of older people discharged from hospitals where they had no clinical uh, need to be to care homes. In April, that figure was 510. An additional 600 were discharged during April to their own homes. In addition to thanking our health and care workers, as I do again today from the bottom of my heart, there are two other groups I want to pay tribute to, um, and these groups are relevant to the two substantive issues that I want to cover today. Uh, the first group is our unpaid carers, who of course provide vital support to family, friends and neighbours at all times. But this pandemic has been an especially stressful time for many of them, and I want to thank uh, each and every one of them, you if you are watching, uh, for your efforts. Uh, one of the ways in which the Scottish Government has already acted to support carers is by establishing a carers allowance supplement that's worth £460 a year. The supplement is paid to around 83,000 people across the country who receive carers allowance, people who are on low incomes and who provide 35 hours or more of unpaid care to a child or to an adult on disability benefits. Last month, we announced that these carers will receive a further coronavirus supplement of £230. Parliament approved our plans two weeks ago, and so people who are eligible will receive this payment at the end of this month, together with their normal carers allowance supplement. The specific date of payment will be confirmed in the next few days. Uh, but let me stress now, if you are eligible, you don't need to do anything to receive uh, this coronavirus supplement. It will be paid to you automatically at the end of the month. I know that this pandemic has been really hard uh, for everyone, uh, but it has been very hard for carers emotionally. You're inevitably concerned about your own health and the health of the people that you are caring for. However, in many cases, it has also been very difficult financially. So this extra payment is one way of providing you with some additional help, but it is also an important way of us acknowledging the help and care that you provide to others. I also want to acknowledge that this week is Volunteers Week. That's an opportunity for all of us to highlight and celebrate the service of volunteers in communities the length and breadth of the country. Of course, uh, like unpaid carers, the efforts of volunteers are important at all times. But the COVID outbreak has demonstrated once again just how much they contribute. The Scotland Cares campaign, which you will recall we launched at the end of March, received more than 80,000 sign-ups in total. 
More than 60,000 of those were from people who wanted to volunteer through the British Red Cross or through Volunteer Scotland. Some have been shopping for their neighbours, making sure people get the food and prescriptions and other essentials that they need. Others have been making befriending calls or providing emotional support to isolated or lonely people. Some are directly helping with the response to COVID-19 and others are volunteering through long-standing community organisations. There are also, uh, of course, some people who signed up who may not have been asked to volunteer yet, uh, but you may well be needed in the future. For example, in supporting people who are asked to self-isolate under the test and protect system. And of course, alongside the tens of thousands of people who have signed up under the Scotland Cares campaign, there are hundreds of thousands of people, uh, of, uh, and many of you watching will be amongst that number, who have been volunteering for years, in some cases for decades. There are also, I know many of you who are maybe not formally recognised as volunteers, but who have been performing important acts of kindness for neighbours and friends for a long, long time. And I want to say today how grateful I am and how grateful the Scottish Government is to each and every single one of you. Our national response to COVID depends on people being prepared to look out for each other and show solidarity with each other. And volunteers are an essential and highly valued part of that collective national effort. Of course, each and every one of us has a part to play in that effort, and it remains the case that the best way in which all of us can show solidarity with each other is by sticking to the rules and the public health guidance. And that is the point I want to end on this afternoon. Uh, you should still be staying at home most of the time right now, and you should still be meeting fewer people than normal. I'd ask all of you to consider whether or not your life feels as if it is going back to normal. I'm sure that's not the case. But if it is, perhaps you should think about whether you are following all of the public health guidance. Because unfortunately and regrettably, uh, our lives shouldn't feel completely normal right now. Uh, and when you do meet people from another household, uh, when you are uh, away from home, you should stay outdoors at all times and you should stay two metres apart from people in other households. Now, you might be reading or hearing in the media today some voices saying that one metre is sufficient. So I want to take the opportunity today to stress that the clear and the strong advice from the Scottish Government is to stay two metres apart from those in other households. Uh, don't meet up with more than one other household at a time. Don't meet more than one a day. And please keep to a maximum, and I stress a maximum, of eight people in a group. Remember to wash your hands often. That is actually more important as you start to meet, albeit at a physical distance, with people from other households. So wash your hands often and thoroughly. And if you're away from your home, out and about, please remember to take hand sanitizer with you. Wear a face covering when you're in shops or in public transport. And again, I, I want to make a, a direct appeal to you here. If you haven't been wearing a face covering so far when you're in a shop or in public transport or in other enclosed spaces, I'm asking you to please think about doing so now because it can offer some protection to other people. It protects them from you transmitting the virus to them if you have it, perhaps without knowing it. And other people who wear a face covering are offering you some protection as well. So again, it's something all of us can do to protect each other. Remember to avoid touching hard surfaces. And when you do touch a hard surface, remember to clean it. And if you have symptoms of COVID-19, which is a cough, uh, a new continuous cough, a fever or a loss of or change in your sense of smell or taste, you should get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. And I want to underline that point today as well. The success of our test, trace and isolate system, test and protect, depends on everyone with symptoms coming forward and getting tested. So if you do experience symptoms, please do not delay, do not do that thing that sometimes in normal times all of us do, wait to see if we feel better after a day or so. The moment you start to experience these symptoms, book a test. You can do that at nhsinform.scot or you can phone NHS 24 on 0800 028 2816. That's 0800 028 2816. Uh, but it is really important that uh, if you experience those symptoms, a cough, fever, 
uh, a loss or change in, in taste or smell, then you come forward and book a test. And above all else, and this is my final point, please remember that the individual decisions that all of us take right now have an impact far beyond our own health and well-being. Uh, our individual decisions right now affect the well-being of our families, our communities. Indeed, uh, they affect the well-being of the entire country. The Scottish Government's responsibility to lead the country through this pandemic and to take all of the appropriate practical steps that we need to take is a responsibility we and I personally take very seriously. But the truth is that our success or failure in suppressing this virus and keeping it suppressed will also depend on all of us as individual citizens and it will depend on our collective efforts as a society. We must all continue to do the right thing by each other, by following all the rules and following all of the public health uh, guidance. So uh, I want to stress today that if we all do that, we will continue to slow down the spread of this virus and we will save lives. So my thanks to each and every one of you uh, for doing that so far. And I ask you to continue uh, to do the right thing. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Fiona McQueen, uh, the Chief Nursing Officer, to say a few words before uh, she, I and, of course, the Interim Chief Medical Officer will take questions as usual. Fiona. First Minister, thank you. Over the past few months, the, the debt we owe to the professionals within our NHS has become incredibly clear. And we wouldn't have been in the position that we're in just now in terms of being able to support people in the health and care delivery without them. What is essential to them in doing their job, of course, is our, our army of volunteers we have within our NHS. And many have had to set aside their volunteering duties because of their own health problems or indeed because of the way that we've protected our NHS to essential and emergency services only. They have been coming year in, year out and provide that friendly face, the, the cup of tea, the fundraising, uh, in, in such a way that makes a huge difference to the way that our, our services are, are delivered. And we owe our volunteers a, 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 an incredible thank you for all of the, the fact that you do and all the things that you do. Some of the, the care that the volunteers have been helping to deliver uh, in recent times has, has again provided that comfort, perhaps running errands so that um, patients who can't have visitors can still have things transferred when their families bring them in and drop and go and they can take them to the wards. They've helped them perhaps source uh, things from the shops that they, they're needing and they have been invaluable in making sure that our patients and their loved ones have a bit more confidence and security that the, the, the human kindness that we're seeing through our volunteers is there on a day and daily basis. Hospital radio, our chaplaincy teams all continue and are all incredibly well supported by our volunteers. They do an amazing job uh, all through the year and we know it also helps their health and well-being too, so it is good for your health. But I think at this time in particular, I would like to say thank you to all of our volunteers right across the country, whether you've had to temporarily step down your volunteering roles or whether that you, you stepped up, you make a huge difference to everyone's lives and we're incredibly grateful to everything that you do. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Fiona. And in case you're wondering where the Health Secretary is today, she is in the Scottish Parliament. She'll be answering questions uh, later this afternoon and also taking part in a debate about uh, the remobilisation of our health service, how we uh, carefully and gradually start to resume services that have had to be postponed uh, during the crisis. And you will be able to watch that later on if you are interested. Um, but I'll now go to questions from the media. And the first question today is from Reval Alderson, BBC Scotland. On. How, uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, yesterday you said you wouldn't hesitate to legislate to ensure compliance with uh, social distancing rules. Do you now regret relaxing those rules uh, just before a very sunny weekend? And do you think that legislation uh, would be enforceable in a way that the Scottish Police Federation has said that they doubt that it would be? Um, no, I, I don't regret uh taking the steps we took last week. Um, I've always known uh, that coming out of these lockdown measures was 
likely to prove in probably many different respects trickier even than, than going into lockdown. And, and let's be honest, going into lockdown wasn't easy and hasn't been easy for anybody. So uh, all along here, we're having to apply some judgments. I've been very clear that sometimes we might uh, get those judgments wrong, and in which case we learn from that and, and try to adapt our response. Um, and that will continue to be the case. We, uh, I remember when I uh, published the, the first paper uh, some weeks back uh, that the Scottish Government published, um, looking ahead at how we might uh, come out of lockdown and the factors and, and considerations we would have to take into account. I remember saying then there are no certainties in this. Uh, the, the path is unprecedented and uncertain. There are risks attached to everything we do, and, but we have to navigate that and I have to lead the process of navigating that as carefully as possible. Uh, but the key point I would stress again today, which is one that I uh, took some time to stress yesterday I, and have actually mentioned already today, is that our success and failure in this, and, and right now, remember, we are succeeding in suppressing this virus, uh, but whether we continue to do that or uh, instead go backwards is down to all of us. I, I hope it has been obvious to you over the weeks how seriously I take uh, my own leadership responsibility and the leadership responsibility of the Scottish Government in this, but we can't do it on our own. We uh, depend on every citizen of this country doing the right thing for themselves and for each other, and it's that spirit of uh, collective desire to do the right thing that has uh, led to the progress we've made. And that is what will continue uh, to deliver that progress. And if we drop that in any way, that's when we will go backwards. Uh, but I, I don't take back anything I said yesterday. Uh, we will always have to monitor the impact of what we're doing. And if we decide that tougher uh, regulation is required or that something that is in guidance now has to go into regulation, uh, we will do that. And, and I take the view the police have done an excellent job in enforcing sensitively and proportionately uh, the regulations we've had so far. And if we change those in future, I've got no doubt uh, that the police will continue to do that. Uh, Gordon Cree from STV. Yes, thank you. A question for both yourself and the Chief Medical Officer. Very understandably, in recent weeks, thousands of people have had operations, consultations, treatments postponed. What impact do you think this has had on them and indeed on the wider health of the country? I'll hand over to the Chief Medical Officer in a moment. I mean, clearly, and again, just let me be candid and frank, that has not been something we did lightly or wanted to do. And nobody can stand here and say that it has had anything other than a negative impact. And we have recognised that all along. Uh, but I hope people appreciate that all along we have had to balance different risks and that's what we continue to have to do. So we've had to balance the risk of uh, allowing uh, hospitals to continue as normal with then the risk of not having the capacity to deal with COVID-19 and also the risk to individuals, the risks to individuals of going into hospital for a, a non-COVID procedure and perhaps being exposed to the risk of getting the virus there, which for people with other potentially serious health conditions could make their condition worse. So these are difficult judgments and, and have been some of, well, not some of, these have been the most difficult judgments I and my ministers have, have had to take ever. Um, and it's because we understand the impact of that that we are uh, very keen to get uh, services and procedures on the, in the health service that have been postponed resumed as quickly as possible. And I said a moment ago there will be a debate in the Scottish Parliament this afternoon that the health secretary will lead, uh, and she has already published a framework in which those decisions are being taken. So that is a real focus uh, of our work now. But again, to be candid with people, we have to do it carefully because we don't know what lies down the path with COVID. We have to make sure our health service continues to have the capacity to deal with any spike in COVID cases now or a few months from now. And we also have to make sure that if we are asking patients to come back into hospitals for more routine uh, procedures, then it is safe for them to do that. And the last point I'd make before handing over to Gregor is we've said all along that if you need uh, urgent or emergency treatment, the NHS remains open and you should not hesitate uh, from calling uh, your GP NHS 24 or 999 as appropriate. Gregor. I've got a great deal of sympathy for people who found themselves in that position where they've been waiting um, extended periods of time for either assessments or, or, or treatment as a consequence of some of the actions that we've had to take uh, to ensure that we continue to provide safe 
um, and effective care within our uh, hospitals. It's not easy for people. And it's not just the physical impact that that has on people, but there's an emotional and a psychological impact as well that we can't underestimate as well. Uh, as people kind of gear themselves up, ready to go into hospital, ready for a treatment that they've perhaps uh, been anticipating and find themselves then that they're, they're, they're stood down. So as I say, my, my, my sympathies are with these people. But the truth of the matter is, for us not to have taken those actions would have been reckless. Uh, we, we have to recognise that it was clinical decision making which was behind those decisions to postpone some treatments or assessments based on the assessment that people uh, would have had increased risk of undergoing those assessments or treatments at that point in time. The important thing we can do now is to make sure that as we start to gear up and remobilise the NHS that we're identifying those people who have the greatest need uh, to make sure that we're prioritising them safely in terms of their return to treatment. Okay, thanks, Gregor. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Scottish Government Freedom of Information request and the answer. The request was for a copy of written briefings or reports that you received from your Chief Medical Officer or National Clinical Director regarding Scotland's planning and preparations for COVID-19. Now that was between the, the dates, the material time between 24th of January and the 9th of March after the first case. The answer that came back was that there was nothing in writing. There was, there was no written report or written briefing either to yourself or to your health secretary. Why was that? Um, I haven't seen the FOI. I'm happy to have a look at it. What I can say categorically is I got um, a great deal of direct briefing from uh, the chief medical officer uh, at, at the time, the uh, interim chief medical officer who was deputy chief medical officer at the time, uh, and, and from others as appropriate across the Scottish Government. I started to chair uh, meetings of the Scottish Government Resilience Committee specifically on COVID uh, around about, I, I can't remember whether it was the 28th or 29th of January, but in that uh, general uh, time frame. So the Scottish Government generally and me um, in, in particular uh, with the Health Secretary were uh, completely focused on this. There, there's a range of uh, different ways and means uh, by which ministers receive advice. Sometimes it's in writing, sometimes it's through discussion um, and I'm sure that's been the case since time immemorial and, and will continue to be the case, particularly in a very fast-moving situation. So that's uh, the, the general response I would give you there, but of course I'm happy to have a, a look at the particular uh, freedom of information request answer that you've got and if there's more I, I want to add to that I'm happy to do so. Uh, if I may, when you say you had direct briefings, uh, is it correct to say that you'd had no Nothing in writing, no written briefings. I think the point I'm, I'm making is I, I, I haven't seen that FOI, so um, I'm not saying you you're doing... Look, I get, James, I get briefings on uh, a whole host of things every single day. Uh, the number of briefings that go across my desk every day um, is, is significant, and, and that is true not just around COVID, and most of the material that goes across my desk right now is about COVID, but in normal times, and certainly uh, back in January, that would have uh, been the case for a whole range range of, of different issues. So what I'm trying to say to you here is, is genuinely uh, meant to be helpful. I've given you a general answer, but you're quoting something to me here that I have not directly uh, seen. I'm not saying uh, that this is the case here. Uh, please uh, be assured about that. But often things are quoted to me and, and inadvertently can be perhaps out of context. So I, I always like to go and have a look at things. And if I've got uh, more that I want to add to my answer, I, I will do that once I've seen it. But I, I would make the, the point that, uh, particularly in a fast-moving situation, uh, there are the, the information and the advice uh, that comes to, to ministers uh, will be in a range of different formats. Um, and that would undoubtedly have been the case, uh, and undoubtedly is the case, when it comes to coronavirus. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, Thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, uh, we've, we first heard of a small number of positive COVID-19 tests at Salt Greens Care Home in Eyemouth on the 24th of April. Now, at the time, the Scottish Borders Council reassured people. They said there were stringent control measures to, quote, minimise the risk of infection. Uh, we now know that seven residents have very sadly died after testing positive, we don't know any more at the moment, though obviously we've asked Scottish Borders Council if they can tell us more. Now, does that sequence of events concern you? 
Have you been in touch with the council to find out more? And are you, on a broader point, uh, happy that now in Scotland, these kind of uh, sad events are being properly reported? Do we now know the scale of the problem in care homes? Um, so I, I don't have the information about the specific care home that you are citing to me. And again, I, I will go and look at that. Um, but what I, I can say is that the care inspectorate uh, engages actively with care homes in all parts of the country uh, and will follow up where there are uh, instances or, or issues of concern. Um, and in terms of reporting, uh, yes, I do believe we are reporting uh, accurate and robust and comprehensive information about the system in care homes, although, as I've said, not just in relation to care homes, but in uh, relation to different aspects of, of this, uh, we are always looking at how we can uh, reliably and robustly increase the range of information that, uh, and, and data that we are publishing, and, and that will be uh, true of care homes. We, we published some information uh, last week uh, about breakdowns uh, between uh, different uh, sectors of the, the care home sector, for example. So, uh, but if, if you think about uh, the NRS figures that will be published tomorrow, they will have uh, very robust uh, information and, and figures for the numbers of people who have died in care homes. So I, I, I do believe that the information is full and comprehensive, but we will also always look to see whether there is more granularity of that uh, information that we can provide. Uh, Fiona, I don't know whether you want to say more um, about care homes in general. As, as we have learned more and more about the virus and about the elderly population's response to that, we have put in additional support to care homes and most recently the, the oversight of the Director of Public Health and, and the other clinical directors within the NHS to provide that support along with the, the Chief Social Work Officer and, and the, the Chief Officers in the, in the partnerships. And what what we are now having is safety huddles within every care home, contact every day with care homes so that we can monitor and assess staffing levels, any absence, any concerns they have about PPE, any infections there are, and of course in terms of management of the outbreaks, the directors of public health are making sure that where there is one case um, of suspected COVID, that all residents and all staff are being tested. So we've put a series of measures in place and we will gradually be able to provide more data and more information as, as time goes on and we collect that. Okay, thank you. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Radio Tay has today spoken with a gentleman called Bill Batchelor who's written to you about concerns over the lack of testing at the Dundee care home where his father-in-law is a resident. He says staff still don't have access to regular testing, despite the announcement made by Gene Freeman on the, the 18th of May. He's been told that, that the health board is having issues implementing routine testing. So I was just wondering, what would be your response to Bill? And, and when will we see regular testing in place for care home staff across Scotland? I'll hand over to Fiona, but th there is a programme of uh, regular routine testing uh, for care home staff uh, already underway. I, uh, my apologies to Bill, I haven't yet seen his letter, um, but we'll reply to him uh, as soon as possible. Um, and obviously, if there are issues uh, from NHS Tayside uh, that you, you cite there about difficulties they're having, I don't know what they are, but we'll look into them uh, as soon as I can after the briefing. But Fiona may want to add to that. Um, we have asked all health boards to submit to us and we now have their plans on testing across their, their homes with, with outbreaks, but also testing of staff uh, and some residents in homes where there are no outbreaks. So yesterday I had a meeting with the Chief Executive of NHS Tayside, along with the Director of Public Health and, and their Senior Nursing Support, and we have agreed additional measures, additional testing uh, support for NHST side by the way of the mobile testing unit but also the UK government uh, care home portal which will mean that every single care home will be able to test every member of staff every week in, in areas where there, there is not COVID and we would expect that to be taken up from with immediate effect there are obviously the other UK government sites but actually making it easy for care homes who don't have COVID because clearly areas where the COVID residents then staff and um, residents are tested, but in homes where there is no COVID, that has been starting and will be with full effect from Monday. Okay, thanks. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. 
Thank you, First Minister. There are a number of Black Lives Matters due uh, demonstrations due to take place across Scotland this weekend. Now, obviously, this will go against uh, current guidance that's in place just now. So what would you say to people who want to peacefully protest but might be putting themselves and others at risk in doing so? Uh, well, I have uh, total solidarity with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. I am also... Um, a fervent supporter and indeed uh, throughout my life I've been a, a frequent participant in peaceful protests so I, I absolutely believe that people have a right to make their voices heard and at times like this when we all look on uh, with concern and horror um, at the scenes in the United States right now it's very important that we, we do have the opportunity to speak up and, and make our voices heard. Um, Obviously, right now, it is the case, unfortunately and, and regrettably, that large gatherings of people could pose a risk to health and indeed to life. And unfortunately, that's the case, whether it is a, a peaceful protest or a football match or any other uh, gathering where large numbers of people are coming together in close proximity. So what I would uh, say to uh, those who want to, to protest and, and say this as as an ally uh, and supporter, is that we need to uh, find ways of allowing people to make their voices heard um, and to uh, make the points that many of us want to, to be made and, and to be heard right now, but to do so in a way that is safe and is not putting people protesting or wider communities at risk. And uh, we are happy at national level, and I know uh, authorities at local level will be happy to have these discussions and offer whatever guidance we can. I hope that... Uh, Everybody, and I know people the length and breadth of the country, and I, I include myself in this number, feel extremely strongly about uh, these issues. And let me say, none of us, no country, no society is immune from racism. Um, and we all have issues to, to look uh, in the mirror about and to confront. Uh, but all of us right now, I think, feel a very strong desire to stand in solidarity uh, with uh, those uh, protesting racism and, and to make clear that it is an evil that has no place in our society. So I would appeal to people to uh, you know, have a discussion and consider how we do that in a way that is safe, but allows us all to send a very strong and unequivocal message about the evil of racism uh, that we want to see eradicated. Uh, Neil Puran from PA. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, a poll has found that uh, just under half of people in the UK have been exposed to misinformation about coronavirus online. Uh, how big an issue has this been in the fight against coronavirus? And do you think the social media companies are doing enough to clamp down on this? Generally speaking, uh, not just on coronavirus, I, I think social media companies have an obligation to do more to uh, try to, to deal with and combat the, the problem of misinformation. Um, and undoubtedly, in a, a crisis situation like this, the, the potential for people to send uh, wrong messages or you know, deliberately um, wrong information to, to confuse people and, and to undermine efforts is, is all the greater and th that responsibility perhaps is, is even greater at a time like this. Um, I, so yes, I, I do have a concern about it, but my antidote and my way of dealing with it is, is to do everything I can, uh, which is why I stand here at this podium every uh, weekday, to make sure that people have a source of information that is uh, straight from government, that is reliable. Of course, people have a right to question it and scrutinise it, scrutinise it and ask questions about it as, as journalists do. But in, when it comes to the public health advice that we're giving people and the, uh, the facts and the evidence as we know it, as it develops about COVID-19 itself, that, then people have that source of uh, information uh, straight from the Scottish government. And, and I will continue to do this, the Scottish government will continue to do this for as long as we think that is, is necessary. And I would appeal, obviously, people who are watching now uh, are getting information from here, but you know, if, if there are people that you think might be getting information from sources that are not reliable, then, you know, point out to them where the, the reliable sources of information are. And I've been heartened. We do uh, polling as the Scottish Government to, to test attitudes so that we can be sure whether our public messages have been heard and understood. And I've been very heartened about the numbers of people uh, in uh, those surveys who say that their uh, principal source of advice and information is from uh, this briefing and from the Scottish Government. So I think, you know, that's my responsibility to combat uh, misinformation is to do everything I can to get uh, good, reliable information across to people. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, it was just regarding your warning about legislation yesterday. Um, if you were to introduce uh, changes to the law and travel limits and group sizes, is there not a risk uh, that you could be punishing law-abiding citizens because of the actions of a tiny mi minority? Um, and also, what discussions have you had with the Chief Constable about whether he thinks this would be enforceable or not? We have ongoing discussions with the Chief Constable about the uh, the measures that we're thinking about taking and, and take his and, and the police view about their practicality and enforceability, and that will continue. As you know, the Chief Constable has uh, stood next to me at, at these briefings on previous occasions, so that uh, discussion is, is very important because there is no point in us uh, passing laws that the police tell us uh, can't be enforced. Um, so we, we always need to take that view as, as we need to take a, a range of views into account. In relation to the first part of your question, yes, there is a risk that if we uh, move to put guidance, which was designed to give people flexibility and allow people to exercise good judgment, if we put that into law, then we will uh, perhaps penalise people who have not been breaking uh, the, the guidance. And the five mile limit is, is a case in point. We, we deliberately left some flexibility there. Uh, not because we wanted to condone people travelling to uh, beauty spots or tourist attractions. We emphatically don't want people doing that. So that's why the five-mile guide for recreation is so important. But we, we didn't want to put a, a, a fixed five-mile uh, limit in law because we recognise that people's nearest and dearest might live slightly further away uh, than that. And so we wanted to leave a bit of room for people to see loved ones that they wouldn't be able to see if that limit was in law. But as I've said before, I still have appealed to people to exercise judgment. Don't go so far that you would have to go inside and, and use a toilet, for example. So I, I want to, to trust the judgment of the people of Scotland as much as possible, because I think that is probably what delivers most benefit, but it also means that we're not penalising people who are not flouting the, regu the, the, the guidance um, by putting more things in, in regulation. Um, so it's because I recognise that risk that we're not rushing to do things. But again, I'll come back to the point I made yesterday. My overall responsibility is to make sure we're doing everything we can to suppress this virus and stop it running out of control again. So if we judge that it is necessary to put more into law than is currently in guidance, we, we have to do that because I would not be fulfilling my responsibility if I didn't do that. So we'll keep these things under review, but it's a good opportunity for me to appeal again. I, I suspect... Um, it may be the case that most people who are watching right now are the people who don't breach uh, the guidance, but I would appeal to everybody watching that please, uh, for good sound public health reasons, but also so that you're not penalising people who are doing the right thing, don't break the rules, don't breach the guidance, because it's in the interest of all of us that we all stick to these rules. Uh, Seth Carell from The Guardian. Good morning, First Minister. Sorry, good, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, thank you. Can I just go back to the answer you gave to James Matthews' question earlier on? Are you telling us that you have no recollection of at any time getting a written report or a written briefing on the coronavirus outbreak and pandemic from either Catherine Calderwood or Jason Leach in January or February this year? And secondly, could you get the Scottish Government Press Office to confirm whether or not that is the case? To add, uh, Sev, to what I said to James, I've said if we have got something to add to what I've said, I will come back later on and do that. And, you know, I uh, have had lots of briefings and lots of advice and lots of information, more than you would probably even begin to imagine on this issue. But, you know, you're, you're quoting dates at me and you're asking me without having it in front of me to confirm what was in writing and what was not. And I'm not going to do that because um, I take... Uh, I take a responsibility to make, for reasons we've just talked about, to make sure the information I'm given at these briefings is, is correct and accurate. So I'm, I'm not going to apologise for saying I'm going to go away and, and look at it in more detail before adding to the answer that I've given. Um, Simon Johnson, uh, sorry, no, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, the, the deadline to agreeing an extension to um, the Brexit transition is approaching fast at the end of the month. Do you believe an extension uh, can yet be reached? Uh, is there any inclination at Westminster to do this from bilaterals or talks you've had with the um, Prime Minister? And if not, can you give us an idea of what impact you uh, fear this may have on Scotland's 
uh, economy which is already battling to deal with the impact of COVID-19. Well, I think my views on Brexit are pretty well known. Um, I, my views on a no-deal uh, Brexit are well known. Um, and uh, my views on the UK government ploughing ahead uh, with a potential, which is a very high-risk uh, potential, of a, a effectively a no-deal Brexit at the end of, of this year, uh, regardless of everything else we're dealing with right now, is, is I just think, deeply irresponsible and reckless. And it would make an already uh, acutely difficult uh, situation uh, economically uh, much, much worse. Um, and therefore, I would, you know, say very directly to the UK government to think again and to do what I think the majority of people, um, those who supported Brexit and those who didn't, would probably think is sensible in the midst of a global health crisis that has also become an economic crisis, is not to compound and, and exacerbate that and, and seek the extension to the transition period uh, that I think is sensible and I think the majority would probably agree is sensible. Whether or not the UK government is going to do that, you would have to ask them. They uh, certainly appear to be pretty uh, resolute in their refusal to do that, but um, I hope common sense prevails because the last thing any of us need to be dealing with right now, if you take from the Scottish government, we are, as I think everybody would expect, uh, absolutely focused on dealing with the coronavirus crisis. But we're also going to, if, if there's no uh, extension request, we're going to have to divert resources from that to thinking about and starting to prepare for the consequences again of a no-deal Brexit. And I, I would just appeal to common sense. Does anybody seriously think right now that that's a sensible thing to be doing? Uh, I don't, and I hope the UK government comes to its senses. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Uh, Health Protection Scotland this morning has published figures showing 510 people were discharged from Scotland's hospitals into care homes in April. Um, I just wondered if you could tell me how many of that 510 were discharged before the guidance was changed on April the 21st uh, to introduce testing into that process. And also, um, Matt Hancock, the English Health Secretary, introduced testing um, from hospitals to care homes on April the 15th, six days earlier. And I just wondered why you waited that extra six days to make the same change here. I, I think I'll leave Matt Hancock to... Uh, talk about his own decisions. I'll talk about my decisions, and my decisions are, are clinically informed and advised, and we take the decisions we think are right at the, the right time. In, in terms of uh, your question about the, the, the time uh, sort of breakdown of that 510 uh, figure, I don't have that information um, at the moment. We will certainly look. It's one of these things that we will look to see whether that can be provided, but that's not information I have uh, right now. Um, I've just One final thing on, on this is... You know, what has happened with uh, deaths in care homes is a, a matter of deep regret to all of us. It's certainly a matter of deep personal regret uh, to me. Uh, we've seen a similar picture in care homes in many other countries across the world. And we learn and, and will apply that learning and knowledge uh, as we, we go forward. Um, but at every stage, we have sought and striven to do the right thing to protect uh, those in our care homes. Um, and let's never forget that those 510 people uh, who in April were discharged from a hospital to a care home, uh, they, they should not have been in hospital because they were clinically ready for discharge from hospital. Uh, so had they remained, in, and I know, and it is legitimate to ask questions about the discharge to care homes, but I would say to people that those questions shouldn't be asked without also remembering that for these people to have remained in hospital would have been uh, potentially damaging to them because delayed discharge uh, is damaging to older people. But also in a, a coronavirus situation, as we were uh, seeing coronavirus cases coming into our hospitals, it would also have potentially put them at significant risk there. So, you know, it is absolutely... Uh, understandable for people to look at the course of action that was pursued and ask questions about that. But what we mustn't do is uh, tell ourselves that there was some perfect risk-free alternative course of action. These are difficult decisions that at all times we take with the best interests of care home residents at heart. And, and we've issued guidance uh, about isolation, infection prevention and control, clinical risk assessments, uh, all of which has been in line with the WHO guidance. They published technical guidance on infection prevention and control in long-term care facilities, I think, on the 21st of March, and all of our guidance has been in line with that. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, 
we hear growing speculation that COVID-19 has actually been in the UK longer than first thought, with some suggestions it could have been here as far back as November, December. And we hear that NHS elsewhere are thinking about re-examining deaths of people around that time, particularly those uh, dying of pneumonia, to see if there have actually been any deaths in the months prior to the first official COVID cases. Um, has the Scottish NHS been asked to do this? And if you haven't been asked, are there any plans to look around uh, deaths at that time? listen to international evidence and, and look to uh, apply that and take any action that we think is, is necessary here. But I'll hand to Gregor to see whether he wants to add anything to that. So at the moment, we've got no firm evidence that, at all that, that um, COVID-19 um, was in the, um, in the UK before the, the, the kind of published dates that we've um, gone with before. Uh, but we should always keep an open mind. And if there is evidence which begins to emerge that suggests we should do a look back and see, and this will be a matter which will be a discussion at the UK level between the, 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 the kind of senior clinicians, and then that's something that, that, that we'll pursue because we've got the ability to be able to look back and to see that. One of the things that we're undertaking just now is trying to understand better those importations of cases that did happen uh, in the UK and the timelines that are associated with those. And we've now got very good documented evidence of how those different strains of coronavirus, the different family groups of coronavirus were imported into the UK um, and across Scotland, particularly um, over the course of the month of March. And, and I hope to be able to say a little bit more about how molecular sequencing is helping us to be able to, um, to tell a little bit more about um, that, that um, uh, path of the disease in those early stages um, in, in the coming days and weeks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Mail. Hi, good afternoon. In the very early days of the coronavirus pandemic, the Scottish Government issued guidance which sought to restrict uh, the, the number of GPs entering care homes, um, GPs and other experts. Um, why was it the case that the Scottish Government seems to have been much more cautious about these uh, very crucial staff entering care homes than they were cautious about untested hospital patients entering care homes? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I would remind you about the guidance we published, and we have published a series of uh, pieces of guidance uh, for care home providers, I think starting on the 13th of, of March and uh, running uh, from then, uh, with advice about uh, the, the risk, clinical risk assessments that should be done uh, for anybody being admitted from a hospital to a care home. Uh, there's also been advice about uh, people admitted from the community into care homes and uh, what uh, care home providers should do around uh, isolation, inf infection prevention and control uh, for people coming into to care homes. So there has been um, a great deal of, of caution and precaution taken there. Um, the issue around testing, which I've, I've talked about many times before, is uh, that you're back then, and it is still the case now, that there are doubts uh, about, or uh, certainly doubts about the relative reliability of testing uh, people who don't have symptoms. And, uh, you know, it's always been the case that there has been a concern about putting too much reliance on testing where that could be delivering false assurance, which is why we put so much emphasis on risk assessment and uh, infection prevention and control. Do you want to add to that? Absolutely. And what we want to do is make sure we also at that same time we reduced visitors and I know that's been incredibly painful for, for people who want to, to be with their loved ones and the clinical assessment about where the best place for the, the resident to be, it may well have been they were going back so they've been from a care home admitted to hospital and back to the care home and the most important thing is infection prevention control PPE to make sure that both the member of staff and the resident is safe. At all times, GPs um, have had access to care homes when appropriate. But remember, we've got incredibly skilled nurses in care homes who can have a telephone dialogue with the GP and between them make sure that the right care is given to the, every resident within the care homes. And where GPs made a decision that it was appropriate for them to visit, then of course they would to make sure they saw their patients safely. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. The latest waiting time figures show nearly all of Scotland's health boards are failing to meet the targets for mental health treatment in children and young people. 
Um, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition says extra funding announced by you in February is not enough and has urged the Scottish Government to invest significantly in services. Why are those waiting time targets still being missed? And what is your response to those calls for more funding? Um, I, I absolutely recognise uh, the, the need for uh, continued funding of mental health services. The, the answer um, on waiting times, there is probably no element of our health service and, and waiting times that haven't been impacted by coronavirus and, and the, the difficulty in seeing patients face to face. But we've been very clear and I've been very clear, we've talked about this a, a number of times at these briefings about the importance of uh, services being in place for telephone and online services to be available for people. Um, I think it's really important that health boards prioritise particularly emergency and urgent uh, cases and that will continue to be important as we come out of, of this crisis. So, um, you know, I, I, we, we announced additional funding to recognise the, the additional demand that would be there for mental health services during a crisis period, but at no point have I ever said, or, or anybody in the government ever said, that that is the totality of the support that we will need to provide for mental health services in the months and, and years to come. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, following on from Derek's question, um, are you expecting sort of a surge in um, need for um, children and young people's mental health services, given the impact the lockdown has on people's mental health, particularly children and young people? And will computerised cognitive therapy, is it likely to be sort of key to getting that backlog down as we, as the NHS needs that? Um, I'm going to avoid using um, headline generating language. Um, but yes, I do think, and I always have thought, that um, we would, well, two, two things will be at play here. Firstly, in mental health services, as well as uh, around physical health services, there will be, as we come out of this crisis, a backlog of, of uh, consultations and procedures that haven't been able to happen during uh, the period of the virus, and we will need to, to deal with that. But you know, I, I think it is self-evident that you know, the, the lockdown and the, the impact on our emotional and mental health uh, of the virus uh, will be such that there will be potentially a, a greater demand for support and advice for people. So we have to factor that in uh, to our planning uh, as we go forward. And on your point about online and, and computerised services, uh, both for mental health and for some other uh, consultations on the health service, then yes, I do think we should look to maximise that in future. We, uh, you know, I th there, there is no aspect of this virus that hasn't been uh, awful and, and terrible, but it has necessitated some changes in how we deliver services, health and other public services, that we should not lose as we come out of the crisis. The, the near me uh, primary care consultation uh, system that I remember uh, launching the rollout of back in the early days of, of this crisis, for example, is something we've been trying to introduce in the health service for a long time, but managed to roll it out completely in a matter of weeks. So some of these developments are positive, And as we come out of a crisis period, we should try to continue to uh, protect and build on them. Do you want to... Uh, one more okay. um, and lastly today, uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hello, First Minister. Um, I just want to clarify the point you made on Sunday about the advice you were given in the early stages. I don't want to go back over the answers that you gave to Michael and Simon and indeed Sophie Ridge about the, the, um, the measures you took, just the advice that you were given. You said back then, prior to April 22, uh, the view was that people who didn't have symptoms, either because they were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, didn't shed the virus. When the actual advice from SAGE and the WHO was asymptomatic was low, pre-symptomatic was low but higher. So the risk wasn't nil. Um, and also on the 26th of February, the, the date of the night conference, incidentally, Philippa Whitford, the SNP health and care spokeswoman asked Matt Hancock about asymptomatic um, transmission. She said, quotes, we are aware that the case that spread the condition to others in the UK involved someone who was not significantly symptomatic. So on Sunday, did you maybe just underplay the advice that you were given? Uh, no, I, I don't think I did. I have never said that at any point we were told the risk of asymptomatic transmission was nil or that it wasn't something being discussed. I don't think 
any, with a new virus, anybody on any aspect of it would have been that definitive. But what I have said and what I absolutely um, uh, maintain is, and, and I think anybody who has been dealing this, with this would, would maintain, is that the, the knowledge and the evidence around asymptomatic transmission has changed significantly as we've gone through this. I mean, you, um, I think, uh, drew our attention to some quotes uh, earlier this week, which, uh, you know, you have, as your right to do, pulled out some uh, particular aspects of this, these quotes. But if, you, if sometimes if you read all of them, you see exactly the point I'm making. So, you know, a, a WHO briefing on the 25th of February, uh, I'm quoting here, you know, with asymptomatics, it doesn't look like that's a big part of, of the picture. Um, on 28th of February, a WHO report, the proportion of uh, truly asymptomatic infections uh, is unclear, but appears to be relatively rare and does not appear to be a major driver of uh, transmission. Um, again, uh, on, in March, uh, asymptomatic transmission is not a major driver of transmission. Uh, you know, as recently as April the 2nd, uh, again, in a WHO situation report, there has been no documented asymptomatic transmission. Um, you know, so nobody has ever said it was nil. You wouldn't be able to say that, but it is absolutely the case that our knowledge and understanding of it has developed. And as it has developed, uh, we have adapted our response accordingly. Uh, Gregor, do you want to add anything? You, you said did not shed the virus. This is what I want to clear up. That does appear to suggest that you're saying it was nil. Did not shed the virus, not that the, 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 what, we, we did the risk not, was low. What, I've just read out to you their opinion that said it wasn't a major driver of transmission. I couldn't say. I'm, I'm a politician and a, a past lawyer. I, I don't have the, the clinical uh, expertise to say definitively whether a virus sheds in uh, asymptomatic periods or not. But I think it's clear from what I've just read out there that at an earlier stage of this, the risks of that were considered to be much lower than many people consider uh, to be the case now. And, and even now, you will find that there is debate uh, within uh, the clinical medical scientific community about this. And that's the point I have made repeatedly. And again, you know, people will have heard me make that point uh, repeatedly at these kinds of updates. But I was going to ask Gregor, uh, who is clinically qualified, if he wanted to add anything. I think this has possibly been one of the most contentious areas uh, that has, and certainly one of the areas where we've developed most evidence and learning over the period that we've been living with COVID-19. And um, that, that, that kind of journey that we've been on to better understand how this virus does transmit from person to person is one that um, is, even to this day, is still revealing new things about the virus and the way that it begins to transmit. Some of that is person to person, some of that is about environmental spread. Uh, and as I say, that learning, I suspect, will continue even from here on in. The, the, the role of asymptomatic transmission is one where there's been increasing interest over the, the, the weeks that we've been dealing with COVID-19. And I think it's now at the stage where we can say that there's certainly a, 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 certainly a greater depth of opinion within clinical circles that asymptomatic spread um, does take place, but, but some of the mechanisms are, are still not clear. For instance, there's still a huge amount of debate around about if you are positive and you test positive for this virus, whether you are able to spread in every case in that pre-symptomatic phase or asymptomatic phase or not. And as I say, the, the, the cl clinical opinion still remains divided about that, um, even here in Scotland. Myself, um, I, I think I'm... I'm um, convinced by the, the, the argument that um, now there is enough evidence to suggest there is certainly some degree of spread in that pre-symptomatic phase. But I would tend to agree with some of the commentators that have been um, uh, quoted in, in the, the relative contribution to what's driving the pandemic is, is, is fairly small compared to the more overt symptomatic spread uh, that, that, that we know about. OK, thank you. That concludes our questions uh, today. Can I thank the journalists, uh, as always, uh, thank Gregor and Fiona, uh, Anna, our BSL uh, translator today, for helping us make sure that this briefing, as always, is accessible for people. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, please remember to follow the guidance um, and uh, abide by all of the different aspects of that. As far as possible, continue to stay at home. Uh, but when you are out, make sure you stay two metres apart from another household. Uh, wash your hands regularly. And if you have symptoms, please, please remember to book a test and get yourself tested. Um, I will be joining you again tomorrow from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I think we kick off uh, on a Wednesday at 12.20. And I'll be taking questions tomorrow from 
uh, opposition party leaders rather than from journalists. But of course, I'll give the same update of the latest statistics. Uh, for now, thank you for joining us.